Welcome. Um, I'm Jen Dintel from Gerber Hart Library and Archives, and welcome to our virtual tour and panel on our new exhibit, Q Activism at the Margins of Identity, about 1990s queer activism in Chicago. Um, Gerber Hart is an LGBTQ library and archives located up in the Rogers Park neighborhood in Chicago. And we've been around since 1981, and we're an LGBTQ library that focuses on the history of Chicago and the Midwest. Um, and I'm very excited today to have all five volunteer exhibit curators here with us tonight. Um, so we have James Conley, Kurt Conley, Chase Aulis, Veronica Rodriguez, and Whit Sadusky. So they worked on this exhibit for over a year, and it officially opened back in September. I know a lot of folks haven't been able to come in to see the exhibit in person, so we thought this would be a really great opportunity to do a little virtual tour and then have a discussion um, and learn a little bit more together about the history of queer activism in Chicago during the 1990s. I'm very excited to introduce James Conley, one of our wonderful exhibit curators who is actually inside the Q exhibit right now with Kurt Conley. So go ahead and take it away, James and Kurt. Hello everyone, I'm James and this is Kurt. I'm Kurt. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is an incredible turnout. I'm absolutely thrilled. You can imagine, uh, you know, for those of us who've been working on this for, gosh, more than a year, <laughs> um, finally getting to open was so exciting. Um, and, you know, then, you know, with everything going on in the world with COVID and everything else, it was uh, really hard not to be able to share this all with you face to face in person as we're used to being able to do, but we're so thrilled. Um, that we're able to do this tonight. So thank you, Will. Thank you, Jen, for the wonderful introductions and, and lead up. Um, so I'm so excited to share this with you tonight. I am going to share my screen. And Jen, if you could give me a thumbs up in a second, and let me know if the screen is shared. Yep, it just okay, popped great. up. Wonderful. So I'm going to start this presentation today. Uh, each one of the curators is going to go over the sort of subject space that they primarily worked on um, in this exhibit. Uh, and I will uh, sort of introduce them and, and drive the exhibit, but uh, we'll all sort of go through this. So uh, first up, we actually have Veronica, who's going to talk about um, the first section uh, of this, which was the Queers Read This document in Queer Nation. So Veronica, take it away. Thank you, James. So Queers Read This, was a leaflet, but really more like a manifesto, published anonymously by queers and passed out at a New York City Pride March in 1990. It was basically a call to arms, or at least a call to radicalization for the nation's LGBTQ communities. The opening lines are here on your screen, but they're really worth reading out loud. How can I tell you? How can I convince you, brother, sister, that your life is in danger? That every day you wake up alive, relatively happy, and a functioning human being, you are committing a rebellious act. You as an alive and functioning queer are revolutionary. There is nothing on this planet that validates, protects, or encourages your existence. It is a miracle that you are standing here reading these words. You should by all rights be dead. So this document goes on for over 12 pages and it tackles everything from anti-queer violence, the AIDS crisis, and even frustration over complacence within the community. In particular, it calls out cisgendered white gay males who enjoy a certain level of privilege by passing in straight culture or by their racial and or financial status. The document also calls out public figures like Jesse Holmes, Ronald Reagan, and even the Pope for their violent homophobia. Queers Read This is most often and attributed to the group Queer Nation, which was also founded in 1990 in New York by a group of activists who had started out with the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power or ACT UP. As an organization, Queer Nation represented a powerful rebuke not only to rising anti-queer violence, but to the assimilationist tactics of more mainstream and longstanding LGBTQ rights organizations of this time. So well-known groups like the Human Rights Campaign, and the log cabin Republicans that mainly sought change from within the legal system and the political system. Queer Nation, on the other hand, promoted direct action against prejudice and demanded and even created space for queers to be out and proud and embraced much more broad goals toward equality and not just tolerance and without compromise. In 1992, local activists chartered Queer Nation Chicago 
Like the New York chapter, QNC rejected this idea that queer individuals had to blend in with straight people for acceptance or even safety. Instead, QNC insisted that queer people not only had this unique experience, but that this experience had its own cultural value and was important to celebrate. So members literally took to the streets to fight for their right to exist on their own terms through marches and protests and die-ins and similar actions. And for its time, Queer Nation with Chicago was also a more inclusive group and they welcomed transgender members, bisexuals, people of color. And this is a time when many other activist groups were largely segregated, meaning even segregated within the larger LGBTQ community. QNC also expanded their work to include abortion rights, women's rights, and positive sex education through partnerships and collaborations with other groups like Cam Sister Spirit, the Dyke March, and the Coalition for Positive Sexuality. Eventually, Queer Nation Chicago gradually disbanded toward the end of the 90s. Many members moved on to other opportunities or continued their work through other activist groups. But even in its brief time, Queer Nation left a strong impact on the path to equal rights for the LGBT community and gave an important voice to anyone who was too impatient and unwilling to just sit and wait for change. So we really hope you'll have a chance to check out the exhibit where you'll be able to see more about Queer Nation and in particular some ephemera, a lot of which has been generously on loan from one of uh, QNC's earliest members, Robert Castillo, uh -huh. including photographs, buttons, pins, flyers, and t-shirts from his personal collection. Jinx. Oh, James, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, along with Queer Nation Chicago, we have a lot of other organizations that were active during this time. And Whit, I pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, James. Um, so while our prompt for this exhibit was the anniversary of the creation of Queer Nation, we quickly found that it was going to be so important to highlight a vast swath of different activists and organizations that sprang up during the 90s. Um, the scene was incredibly varied in its advocacy and even in its interpretation of queer identity in general. Um, every group, every individual in the movement had their own definition of what it meant to be queer. And uh, they were empowered to fight for not just their right to exist, but also to thrive and live in a way that felt right to them. Uh, the voices of the marginalized were really the power behind the movement. Their tactics of achieving their goals were as vibrant and varied as the communities they fought for and represented. And it can be argued that no one shone more vibrantly um, than the self-proclaimed gay mayor of Chicago, Joan Jett Black. Uh, so she's gonna be the first individual I'll be talking about. Um, that's a quote on screen from Joan when she was being asked about um, moving to the White House. Uh, Gays and lesbians have a way of blending in and queers don't. I'm taking something that doesn't blend in and putting it somewhere it really doesn't blend in. And the quote finishes with the White House. Um, so if you're not already familiar with Joan, she features prominently in the exhibit. Uh, she worked very closely with Queer Nation, serving as their hand-picked candidate to run for mayor of Chicago in 1991. Um, as a drag artist and activist, uh, Joan embodied the kind of quick-witted, unapologetic, anti-assimilationist persona that Queer Nation needed to spread their message. And she became a symbol of the queer liberation movement, amplifying the plight of the marginalized, both locally and nationally. But Joan was just a single voice among a cacophony of others, um, of which I'd like to highlight um, a few that feature in our exhibit. Um, the first of which is the Lesbian Avengers, a personal favorite of mine. The Lesbian Avengers were self-proclaimed direct action dykes. Um, that is a recruitment poster from them on screen. Uh, they had uh, lofty intersectional goals that went beyond the simple quest for acceptance and visibility in a world that didn't accept them. Um, their in-your-face activism demanded attention and didn't care very much about making people, especially straights, comfortable. Um, one of my favorite actions uh, to talk about was one that they led in response to a tragic, deadly firebombing, which took place in Oregon. Um, that action consisted of them eating fire and chanting, the fire will not consume us, we take it and make it our own. So that's pretty badass. Um, they are um, an amazing and were an amazing group and we have some awesome pieces from them in our exhibit. Um, the next group I wanted to highlight uh, that features prominently in the exhibit is Transgenesis. 
Um, they were an organization led by Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame inductee, Lorraine Sadie Baskerville. Um, now, transgenesis was actionable in a more community-based way and focused on the needs of the transgender community across Chicago. They advocated and worked within the system, focusing on education, medical care, behavioral health access for trans and queer homeless individuals. They also did HIV AIDS activism, as well as taking part in protests. I personally love learning, learning about Lorraine while researching transgenesis, and Gerberhardt is very lucky to actually have her personal collection in our archive, some of which features in the exhibit. Um, one very powerful piece, which is on display in Q, um, is from her collection, and it's a group of hand-drawn posters of murdered trans and queer youth. Some names you may be familiar with, like Brandon Tina, um, but others, like Christina Page, are less widely known, but just as important to remember. So I'm really glad we were able to put those up in the exhibit. Um, the last group that I'd like to briefly touch on before um, we hand it over to Chase um, is the Pink Angels. Um, this organization sprung up in response to a rise in queer targeted violence, um, which was occurring in Chicago's neighborhood, then called Boys Town. Um, the city of Chicago was tracking the rise in violence, but not necessarily doing much of anything to stop it on a night to night basis, which is where the angels came in. Uh, they would patrol the streets um, at night dressed in their signature black berets, leather jackets, and walkie talkies, and served as a physical deterrent for anyone wanting to come into the neighborhood and start trouble with people just out being their unapologetic selves. Um, they took the slogan bash back very seriously, and their presence in the community definitely made it that much safer. Um, all right, so that's me done. Uh, there are other groups um, that I wasn't able to touch upon in such a short amount of time. Horizons Anti-Violence Project, the Chicago Black and Lesbian Gays, the Bud Billiken Parade, Camp Sister Spirit, um, but hopefully we get to a point in the city where all y'all that want to come down and feel safe coming down will be able to see the exhibit in person and um, see everything live. So thank you. Thank you, Wit. Um, now we're going to move over to Chase and he's going to talk to us about Homocore Chicago. Great. Thanks, James. And thank you, Wit. Um, so when curating this exhibit, we, of course, you know, we really wanted to focus on the organizations the, and, the ins, and the individuals that had a big influence on this, uh, on queer culture at the time. But we also really wanted to bring into focus the ways that queer folks are, um, were expressing themselves and that they didn't necessarily fit into the mainstream. And we absolutely couldn't do that without talking about homocore. So what is homocore? So it was this imaginary movement in this queer zine um, that was in Toronto called JDs. And that was started by these two filmmakers named Bruce LaBruce and GB Jones in 1986. And uh, the zine was filled with sexual fantasies, punk rock, other depictions of like a countercultural lifestyle, quote unquote. Um, but it was basically uh, Bruce's and GB's uh, reaction against what they thought was the assimilation and mainstream conformity of both the gay and the punk movements. So. Um, JD's only published, I think, maybe nine issues over several years, but Homocore, their, the concept grew out of this just imaginary movement on the page and into this emerging rock movement. And if you're actually interested about, uh, in uh, Homocore as a topic, Gerber Hart has a full book about it called uh, Homocore, The Loud and Raucous Rise of Queer Rock. So you should check it out if you're interested and you can come into the, to the space. So... Uh, following JD's Inter Homo Core Chicago, which was formed by these two queer punks named Joanna Brown and Mark Freitas, who had met uh, thanks to a connection from this uh, festival called Spew Fest, which was this queer zine festival that took place at Randolph Street Gallery in 1991. And so these two uh, people, Mark and Joanna, got together and they organized this queer punk night, which debuted in November 1992 at this uh, bar in Wicker Park called Czar Bar. Um, and no longer exists, but it was this hole in the wall bar. And their first show was performed by this queer core band named Fifth Column. And the drummer for that band was actually uh, GB Jones, who was one of the founders of um, JDs. So uh, Homocore Chicago ran for about eight-ish years, and it hosted band, uh, shows by bands like Vaginal Davis, Bikini Kill, Pansy Division, Tribe 8, God is My Co-Pilot, Los Crudos, and some less explicitly queer um, acts like Slater, Slater Kenny and the Luna Chicks. And it grew to book other venues and a number of other bands from outside the city as well. And in May 2000, this final show um, was uh, done by Le Tigre up at the um, Preston Bradley Center, which is just right up here on Lawrence. And that was Le Tigre's uh, debut performance in Chicago, which was really cool. 
Um, but beyond just Homocore as a concert series, it really helped out or participated in several other areas in Chicago's queer communities. So on several occasions, they marched in Chicago's Pride Parade and they were, would hold up signs like um, Stonewall was a riot, not a brand name and your pride equals their profits. But they also hosted benefit concerts for queer and HIV focused organizations. And so to that point, even as just a concert series, Homocore really carved out this fringe and intersectional space that, um, for those at the margins and not just of society but also within lgbtq spheres and so that um, those folks on the margins could actually feel welcome and so to paint you another picture of that um to advertise for homocore they were putting up all these flyers around wicker park on the, like street signs and lampposts and everything that just had homo in just large emblazoned letters on pink paper just all across the top and you can see some of those on there on our um bathroom stall there um, and this is all happening at a time when AIDS was laying siege to queer communities, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was barring gay people from openly serving in the military, and when trans rights weren't even a thing to be talked about. So this was kind of a really huge deal at the time for this just to be like, hey, we're having queer punk rock and you're going to deal with it, you know, all over the city. And yes, I did mention a bathroom stall. So we really wanted to try and immerse you into a homo homocore experience. And we ended up creating um, just this bathroom stall that you can see on the screen that was just covered in flyers and stickers and sketchy handwritten notes. Um, and at the bottom of that trough that you can see, there are some faces of politicians that are kind of cut off um, that were uh, serving at the time. So it's kind of a really fun immersive experience. But uh, big thanks to Joanna Brown and uh, David Rustiel, who uh, lent us several materials that really helped bring this part of the exhibit to life. So I hope you all get a chance to go into the exhibit and see it. So thank you and back over to you, James. Thanks, James. Yeah, this was a super fun project. When we do the q and I'll bring the uh, camera over so you all can see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right, now I'm going to pass this over to something that's very connected to a lot of that culture, which is our zines, which Kurt will talk about. Everyone, um, so zines are self-published, either produced by a single person or usually a collaborative endeavor. Uh, they're created using mundane means of printing, photocopies, Xeroxes, printer paper, you know, collage magazines, sort of whatever, you know, these groups could find and had on hand. Um, zines have existed since around the 1940s. Um, they didn't really come into their own until the 90s with, you know, movements like uh, Homo Core and Third Wave Feminism and the uh, Riot Girl scene, most notably. Um, and for a lot, a lot of these communities, queer creating queer zines helped to connect communities uh, that were underwhelmed with what mainstream gay culture had to offer. Um, you're seeing the video here. That's this is just sort of a, a taste of all of the the, the collection of zines we have here. Uh, some of them are very in your face. You know, they they pull no punches. They're unapologetic, um, and they were about really finding your people. Um, for instance, Vaginal Davis, a uh, big proponent of feet. She's a fan of feet and she <laughs> created many zines about her love of feet. And, you know, to maybe other people that were into feet, you know, this was their, their, their avenue into finding their people, you know. Um, you know, it, it provided them all to, you know, a space for them to share their experiences and passions and, you know, really fostering collaboration. Um, it, it's also very exciting that in the past couple of years, zine culture has really like blossomed all over again. And, you know, people are creating zines about all their, you know, amazing weird niche, you know, things and it's just it's really exciting to have worked on this on this exhibit with with these zines from the 90s that really defined you know the underground culture and now we're having this resurgence again of of all of these underground you know underground things i don't know <laughs> um but i'm you know super excited for you all to to eventually come in and see not only the display we have but you can come in and take a look at all the zines we have a lot of them are from from the, the Midwest specifically, but some of them are, you know, we have some from kind of all over Toronto, Los Angeles, and it's really cool. It's one of my favorite parts of this exhibit, so. 
Pass it on back to you. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Um, fun fact, Kurt is also a collage artist. And so as you can see in the video there, that entire back wall of collage, um, uh, he uh, designed as well. I did. So, I did. <laughs> um all right and that leads us into our sort of like last wall um and we're calling this wall the for pay wall <laughs> how gay representation tried to tame the queer spirit um you know so we've talked about what was going on in chicago what was going on in the world we see a lot of representation in homocore in the music scene the punk scene and how communities are coming together around a lot of these sorts of things um oops are we frozen Oh, we might be frozen. Okay, we're we back. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Everything froze on our screen, so yes. we were just like, oh. Want to make sure you didn't lose y'all. <laughs> um, so one of the things, you know, I'm so personally, I'm a media librarian. Um, I work with a lot of film and television history, and so one of the things I was, I'm always interested in is how are we represented in the mainstream, right? So we've talked about a lot of what's happening in the underground and what's happening in Chicago and the Midwest and these sorts of spheres. But what did we look like to the rest of the world? Um, you know, many of us who were in our teens or 20s in the 90s remember like Ellen and Will and Grace and these big sort of like landmark moments of like, oh, there's a gay person on television. I can't believe it. Like somebody actually said that word out loud. Um, but it's also interesting to think about in the context of this exhibit in the context of queerness in the 90s and the undefinable otherness um, that defies categorization of queerness and what specifically you're fighting for, as Veronica was mentioning, you know, the battles between HRC and the queer community and how HRC was primarily looking at, you know, the cis, white, gay, male experience because it was an easier and more palatable experience for the masses to get behind. Um, you have things like Will and Grace and Ellen, which are groundbreaking in ways, but also fit very neatly into stereotypes and into expected narratives for straight audiences. Um, Possibly representation in cinema and other media has never been easy to come by. But in the 90s, it saw, we saw a rise in very specific form of representation, that which I'm referring to as gay for pay. The term originates from the idea that straight or otherwise heterosexual actors in pornography or similar professions will have sex with somebody of the same gender if the money is good enough. This creates a fantasy that's at once removed from reality for curious voyeurs and also a charade to quote unquote satisfy the noisy needs of queer people. Um, that's really how, you know, it feels like when you look at a lot of this stuff, and I'm going to play the video in the background so you can get sort of like an array. When I was initially conceiving of this wall, I thought like, okay, I'm going to like label this gay or for pay, and we're going to sort of like be very specific about that if the video will allow it. Come on, you've all been so good so far. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I thought was more interesting is that because queerness in and of itself is very undefinable, we look at queer theory and queer theory even as sort of a, an academic discipline said like, well, can we even have an academic discipline? Because then we have to, by necessity, put it in some kind of box that we can study. Um, when you look at a lot of these films, you have things like Will and Grace, which we understand it's a rom-com, it's a couple of friends, it's their romantic and dating lives. But then you have something like Doom Generation, which is very different. And it sort of fits itself outside the box. And Greg Garaki is a director who is not interested in making a, a simple, straightforward narrative um, for straight audiences. So really it was this combination of what was being produced with predominantly heterosexual actors or people who at the time were in the closet um, representing our gay narratives, which as sadly we all know still happens plenty today. <laughs> we've gotten pretty lucky with some films like Tangerine and things like that where we've had actual queer or trans um, people playing themselves in their own roles. Um, but especially in the 90s, it was just a lot easier to have straight people playing. So when you actually had queer people playing these roles, it was a really big deal. Um, when you had narratives that didn't fit neatly in what straight people expected out of their stories, you were able to see yourself represented on street, screen. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you um, watch a movie like Doom Generation, you're like, ooh, 
<laughs> this is kind of this is subversive. This is bad, you know. Um, and then other times you'll watch a movie like Bound, and you're like, oh, I love this. Like, you know, these people like refuse to be categorized, refuse to fit in a box, and they're just living their damn best lives, and they're gonna win the day, you know. So it was the first time when you get to see some of these things that feel a little bit more authentic. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, I mentioned HRC before, and it's this radical versus traditional portrayal, which I think is reflected in a lot of what we've been going through in the exhibit, right? This, these either or, this push and pull of do we fit into this assimilationist society, or are we really fighting for our unique, beautiful individuality? So that's my section. Um, <laughs> this is us. <laughs> As we, you know, as we worked this for over a year, and when we finished up, we were deep in the throes of COVID already. So we're all being our our <laughs> safest selves that we could be in the space. Um, but I absolutely loved working on this exhibit. It's as always, it's been a pleasure to work with everyone at the Gerber Heart. You know, uh, many of us have worked on several exhibits here. Everyone who works here, everyone who comes in and has a story to tell or has a collection that they want to offer us really enriches the entire narrative and the entire history. So it's been um, just a phenomenal experience. And with that, we'll move to the Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, James. Um, and thank you to all five of our curators for all the work that you did on this exhibit. Um, I know it's, it's an incredible exhibit. I hope more people can come in and see it in person some point soon too. Um, so we're going to move on to the question and answer part. So again, you know, if you have a question and you want me to read it out, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, if you have a question that you want to ask yourself, you can virtually raise your hand. So you can do that by selecting the participants box and then hitting raise hand from there. Or if you're on a smartphone, you can select the dot, dot, dot more and then do raise hand um, on there as well. I'm wondering, James, do you want to stop sharing your screen just so that it kind of frees up Perfect. Um, all right, so I think for a first question, um, I actually, Kurt, if you're free, can you talk about how the exhibit design came together? Um, like what inspired you for the exhibit? This is towards me, yes. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> um, I mean, this, this is a very huge, a huge part of, of the design process. Um, they, you know, they there was just so much visual material to to work with and sort of sort through, and it was it was a delight, honestly. Like um, a lot of a lot of the design also just came from kind of that gritty '90s aesthetic that was everywhere in that sort of era. You know, there were just a lot of you know all, in its own way, design was really sort of breaking the mold of of what was sort of traditional for like design. And so I took a lot of inspiration from, from those elements. And, you know, we went with, you can see back here, the, the cue that, you know, just signifies our exhibit. We went through a lot of different, different designs. You know, we were like, does it need to be gritty? Does it need to be like broken? Does it need to be something? And we thought the easiest solution was, you know, don't sweat it, you know, just have this humongous letter form and kind of let it do its work <laughs> for <laughs> for us. But yeah, you know, say the zines and, and sort of doing the bulk of the, uh, the the homo corner, as we call it, was was a huge, a huge inspiration. It's great. I know, I know, Chase, you mentioned a little bit about this when you were talking, um, but speaking of the homo corner, can you talk a little bit more about the bathroom stall, why it's there? Was there any discussion about it? Oh, there was a lot of discussion. Yeah, so <laughs> we we did. We we built a bathroom stall. And actually, big props to James for putting in the bulk of that construction project and Kurt for a lot of the design that's in there. And I think James is walking you over there now. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we really wanted to immerse folks into something that was like a homo core experience while physically being in the exhibit. So we thought, have you seen bathroom stalls at concert venues? And from that, we just kind of ran with it. And I will be the first to admit that I was skeptical about putting a trough in a library exhibit, 
but you know what? It works here. It really does. And so, um, because think about it, like bathroom stalls aren't just like dingy spots in concert venues where you don't want to touch anything, but I mean, they are that, but they're also canvases. So in our stall, you can see um, there's flyers, there's graffiti, there's illustrations, there's cutouts, stickers, profanity, and it's all smashed together into this like fluid manifesto of political and cultural resistance. So thinking about that, HomoCore itself like carved out this physical space in the 1990s where this message could move out of the bathroom stall and into the open concert halls and into city streets and on light posts. And that's really had a lasting impact. So like, br like bridging off of that, after HomoCore ended, other groups and events started kind of taking up the same mantle. So the first one that uh, comes to mind was um, Clit Fest, which stands for Combating Latent Inequality Together Fest. And it was a women-centered event that also addressed um, homophobia and racism. And that started in Minneapolis in 2004, and it popped up in Chicago in 2008. And then you had the Black and Brown Punk Show Collective, which um, has changed names into the Black, Brown, and Indigenous Crew. And they formed in 2010 and held their first festival in 2012. And they focused really on concerns of people of color and punk. And they're still active today. And if you're on Facebook, you can find them on uh, under the title, Or Does It Explode? Black, Brown, and, and Indigenous Crew. And then finally, of course, um, there was Fed Up Fest, which had its first festival in 2014. And they continued the work of centering marginalized folks like Homocore did um, for the other parts of their identity. But you know, when Fed Up Fest started, being gay was a lot more OK in, in public, right? Um, so Fed Up Fest ended in 2017. But um, still, you know, all this lasting impact coming out of Homocore and out of all this like idea of like this canvas on this bathroom stall kind of thing. And finally, just, you know, be beyond just these groups existing and hosting events and everything, thinking about music today and technology today, it's a lot easier to discover music, even passively. Social media allows groups interested in anything at all to convene across mass distances, form communities, et cetera. And Spotify even has a curated queer core community playlist. So, you know, it's it's just a lot. Homocore did a lot to kind of create this. And so we really wanted to put you in that space. So that's the bathroom stall. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think so. We actually had a, a, a question submitted ahead of time. And again, if you have questions, audience members, and also if you were an activist in Chicago in the 90s, I know I see a few of you on here. If you want to share your story, feel free to raise your hand too. Um, one question was submitted ahead of time, and it was Are there communities or areas of the city that you personally feel are underrepresented in this exhibit? If that's true, how do you address that? So I'm not sure who wants to take that. Um, if no one would mind, I would like to take that first. Um, so as the acting archivist for Gerber Hart, um, what we lacked in the exhibit, we found was what we were lacking in our archives. Um, so the history of Gerber Hart, obviously starting back in the 80s, our collecting styles did focus primarily in the beginning, um, and we were getting lots of collections from cisgendered white um, gay men. Um, so we have been trying um, more recently to branch out. Um, we want our collection at Gerber Hart to represent all marginalized societies um, in Chicago. Um, I personally am trying to seek out more trans collections. I want more black and brown collections. I would love to hear the stories of more indigenous um, individuals in the city. Um, and we found that when we were searching our collections put things in the exhibit, um, we found that um, uh, black and brown voices were underrepresented, trans voices were underrepresented as they've always been. Um, so Gerber Hart is actively seeking right now um, to branch out and make sure that all stories are being told. Um, and I think doing the research for this exhibit and digging deep into the archives really hit that home. And we're excited about what the future holds after the pandemic, um, because I think we will be reaching farther into our, to our arsenal, um, connecting with more South Side uh, groups, connecting with more West Town uh, groups. Um, so I am looking forward to post-pandemic uh, collections to come in. To follow up on what um, <clears throat> DeWitt was saying, um, I think, What's interesting about this exhibit for me and in, in to that question, um, in contrast to the other exhibits we've done, which have been, you know, from everywhere from like the 40s, 50s, the 60s and 70s, um, something that was new for us in this exhibit um, 
and also a huge benefit mm -hmm. uh, as Wit said, like we were able to connect with people and get some of these phenomenal materials for this exhibit is that a lot of the activists are still active now. They're still in the mm -hmm. Chicago area. I mean, and you know, when you're looking at something from the 1920s, usually those activists aren't alive anymore. You know, so this was a huge opportunity for us because we actually got to connect with people who were in the movements and in many ways are still active. Um, you know, so I just want to take, you know, a moment to really point out the value of, you know, our community, the fact that all of you are here with us right now. You all have stories to tell. Um, you know, you've got boxes of papers, you've got photos from times in your life where you participated in something or your partner does or your friends, or your community does. Um, one of the best ways that Gerber Heart can become a more inclusive space with our history is by connecting with people one-on-one -on -one and being a resource uh, for when you're looking to get rid of like 10 boxes of photographs that you don't know what to do with anymore. Um, we would love to have them um, because your history is, is our community history. Um, and the only way that our history becomes more inclusive is if we are able to connect with people in the community um, you know, who haven't been represented enough um, to bring those collections in and to really sort of start to fill in and to tell a more full, real, honest story. So, um, you know, that's, that's a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> Always love the plugs, definitely. And then we have, we actually have a story to share. So Veronica Drake was an activist in the 1990s and I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. That's me. Hi, everybody. I, I was a board member of the Gerber Hart Library from about 1990 to about 1997. And uh, during that time, I did uh, quite a lot of things. I was a member of ACT UP and Queer Nation. Um, I, I see a few of the people around here, like Robert. Hello, Robert, I haven't seen in ages. And uh, I live in Florida now, I live in Central Florida and I've lived here for about 16 years, but I wanted to share something. I ran and got something to show. Let's see, Lesbian Avengers. We're snatching the power. <laughs> I love that shirt. I have a, actually a few of these. My, my girlfriend at the time was, uh, uh, she was the leader of this uh, Lesbian Avenger uh, chapter in Chicago. So uh, a lot of things, um, what can I say? I was also a, uh, an organizer of the 1993 March on Washington, uh, local for Chicago. Um, I've been involved in a lot of different gay and lesbian organizations in Chicago. Actually, often one of the only African-American women and African-American persons uh, anywhere. So it's um, it, it's really it's really great to see the diversity I, I've seen uh, coming out of uh, of Chicago. So um, that's pretty much my spiel. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for the show and tell too. I love seeing the T-shirt. <laughs> I actually the Gerber Hart Library has a, a lot of my stuff. If you go back through the library, a lot of ACT UP stuff I donated because obviously you know, they, you guys, you know, need it for, for show and tell more than I do. Uh, my cat does, isn't impressed even by this. <laughs> yeah, Veronica, I was going to, uh, to thank you. I've, I've been through your collection a lot. Um, and there's a lot oh. of amazing stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I helped out the archivist for years, but when we first started the Gerber Hart library, it was in a basement of a house and it was only one way in and one way out, and it was very scary uh, because we were a gay and lesbian organization. We had, you know, basically targets on our back. So it was for me to sit there by myself, and you know, as the uh, the person who was supposed to um, open up and everything on a Saturday was a very scary time. But um, I also recall running over to the uh, to that place when it flooded and having to, uh, and seeing a lot of our boxes bobbing up and down and us grabbing it and trying to get as many out as possible. So as much as there is there, there is a lot more that did not survive. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I'm 
Perfect. So if you know if you have more questions, stories, please please go ahead and just send me a chat or raise your hand. Um, I think I'll ask. Let's see. Let's ask Veronica. Veronica. Um, so you talked a little bit about Queer Nation Chicago. So I know a lot of those um, donations. You know, we we receive those individually from Robert Castillo. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like working? with a collection that is so recent where you can talk to an individual, where you can actually follow up with someone about questions, you know, just, can you talk? That Veronica. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Two Veronicas. That was confusing. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's one of the really exciting things about working on this exhibit is that you're not relying on a historian or sociologist perspective on why peace is important or worthy of saving. You can ask the person who's standing right in front of you what was happening in this photograph? What did this mean to you? Why is this otherwise ratty looking shirt still in the back of your closet from 1993? I mean, and it's incredible also to have this opportunity to work on such recent history because I think that I must have emailed Mr. Castillo multiple times following up, like I forgot, I had another question, I have another question. And so it, it think that that also kind of comes through in the exhibit because there's a sense of immediacy and urgency in that we were able to I hope, um, provide a voice that felt like you're there, you're walking down the street, you're seeing these things posted on the wall, you're in the bathroom stall. Um, we had that sense as we were working on it that we can actually reach out and talk to these people and we wanted to give people a sense that you're there and you're experiencing this crazy chaotic radical time. I don't know if any other curators want to talk. I know for me, I, I helped curate the past exhibit on lesbian feminism, and I knew it was it was simultaneously really intimidating to be working with materials where people were going to actually come in and see their materials in the exhibit, and then also just really inspiring and really helpful to be able to ask for clarity, because so often materials and archives, you can't get any other information than what you actually have in front of you. So I know that was, I really loved that on the past exhibits. I can actually kind of speak to that too, working yeah. on the Homocore collection. Um, I, I swear, Joanne and I texted back and forth for months and months and months trying to get in touch. And then of course, you know, a global pandemic up and everything. And we were about to exchange, uh, or she was about to lend us her collection and all of a sudden we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and so it was like just months talking about like, oh, what do you have in your collection? Can we see some of it? And so we, she would send me scans. And finally, we all got to meet at Gerber Hart, like across a giant uh, table. Um, and we got to look through the collections and it was just so like magical finally to see it all. And she could just tell us her story. And a couple of the people came in too, to talk about it that were also part of the homo core movement. And it was just, just such an exciting thing to finally, I don't know, put it all together and to be able to talk through the stories through the like pieces that you're actually holding in your hands. And it was just really amazing to just hear the stories live instead of having to just read about them. So just a lot of really cool things. And, you know, hopefully once this pandemic ends, uh, you know, we had some programming ideas that hopefully can come to fruition that those people were gonna be involved with. So really got my fingers crossed for something like that in the future. Agreed. Um, and then we have a story and an announcement from Robert Castillo. So Robert, I will go ahead and unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, um, well, the first, I, I just want to make a quick announcement, then I'll go into the story. Um, for folks that are out there, um, the my late husband, John Pennycuff, who was also involved in Queer Nation Chicago, um, they just opened up the John Pennycuff Memorial Apartments in Logan Square, which is an 88 unit uh, LGBTQ friendly, affordable uh, apartment project. So I just wanted to let folks know that they're taking applications and if LGBTQ folks want to apply to live there, please do so. Um, it's a nice legacy to my late husband and it's nice to have a building named after a queer person who did some really good stuff both in Logan Square and Chicago. Um, so that's the announcement. I'm, I'm very happy about that. And his building sits at Robert Castillo Plaza. So I think that's pretty cool too. Um, one of the stories I wanted to share, and uh, I'm also going to be donating more of my archives, hopefully once COVID is, is subsided a bit, um, involved the Cook County Human Rights Ordinance. Um, there was an ordinance that was proposed by um, Richard Phelan, who was then the board president, which would cover only unincorporated Cook County, which meant that most of the folks 
LGBTQ folks would not have protection. So, you know, he had been waffling on the issue. So uh, we attended every single Cook County board meeting. And one day we decided that we were gonna serve waffles to the Cook County board um, because they kept going back and forth. Um, so we actually did, I, me and John actually made the waffles the night before put them in little baggies with pink tags that say stop waffling on our rights. And in the middle of the board meeting, uh, we stood up and said, you know, today we're serving you breakfast. And several other members actually, you know, went over and served the waffles to the Cook County board meeting. Of course, we were promptly removed, but I think it was one of the coolest actions that we've ever, you know, did. You know, there were some other things that we did that I'd rather not disclose, but, you know, through queer nation, but we did, you know, address, you know, queer rights directly, and it did include the equality, visibility, identity of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. So, um, like you had mentioned earlier, we were very inclusive of bisexual and transgender um, issues. So I think, you know, it's cool to see that the community has kind of caught up somewhat. So, you know, I'd like to say that's progress, but unfortunately, you know, we're still do it, dealing with transphobic attacks, murders. People are still afraid to come out. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but I, I'm glad me and, and quite a few people who I know are, are listening tonight have helped play a role, you know, to get us, you know, maybe a little further in that journey. So that's about it, but thank you. I was gonna say, thanks for sharing. And I, I remember months ago when you brought your stickers in and looking through all of those and, and, and the photos that you've, you've lent and, and they're really incredible. So thank you. Um, we have a, a question from River. Um, so River says that she would love to hear more about trans activism during this time and how it was connected to previous activism and activism today. So I'm not sure who wants to take that. So I think I'd like to just go back to transgenesis. Um, so transgenesis was started by Lorraine Sadie Baskerville and was really one of the most amazing prominent uh, trans activists in Chicago back in the 90s, um, actually started transgenesis from her studio apartment um, and then moved six years later down the line to an actual building. Um, so just over that period of time, you can see the how the community sort of built around her. Um, but yeah, the T in LGBTQ um, is always woefully underrepresented. Um, and the line of activism from the 90s to today um, waffles back and forth. And it, it is hard to draw a line from activism back then to today. Um, as Robert said, um, you know, uh, the amount of transphobic violence perpetuated against um, black trans femmes is still and remains to be a woeful issue that we deal with. Um, I think we also are lulled into a false sense of security here in a liberal city like Chicago, um, but across the country, um, trans femmes, particularly black trans femmes, indigenous trans femmes um, are the target of attacks on a daily basis. Um, and I think that our community, as they did back in the 90s, needs to look inwardly um, and make sure that the most marginalized, the most at risk, um, are being paid attention to, are being listened to, are being uplifted and supported um, financially and socially. Um, and we, as Gerber Hart, you know, as a staple of the queer community in Chicago, need to be doing more. Um, and I hope that we do um, form that line from, you know, things started by Lorraine and others back in the 90s and can pull us forward to today. If anyone else would like to speak or contribute at all, um, please feel free right now. I was going to say there was a, a message from Robert also mentioning a chapter of transsexual menace that was in Chicago for a period of time in the 90s as well. And then we also have a story from Miguel. So Miguel, I believe you're actually already unmuted. So feel free to share your story. Oh, hi everybody. Uh, Miguel Ayala here um, saying hello from Washington DC where I live. Um, I actually work for Jan Schakowsky by day. So um, I get to uh, 
advocate for for the library and 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 queer things uh, in from the north side of Chicago all the time. Um, but my my own personal story, I wanted to start by saying uh, Lorraine was a counselor at Horizons when I walked in there as a young queer boy in uh, 90, probably 94, 95. Um, and she was probably one of the first trans, uh, trans members I've ever, trans people I've ever met. Um, and she was very helpful in my very, very, very formative years. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, but I wanted to just mention, um, I went on to, um, help start the LGBT pride club at Whitney Young high school. And, um, I was just home, uh, visiting my mom and she has a bunch of of my boxes of things. And I went through some of that and I grabbed um, just some random stuff like sign in sheets from a meeting in 1996, uh, a copy of our pride constitution, the pride club constitution, um, a press release, which I'm sure Rick Garcia is familiar with. Um, Cause I met him at our first press conference where we said, Hey, we want to start this uh, pride club and the school administration is trying to block us. So, um, so Rick, Rick Garcia was there to help and uh, he taught me, uh, you know, kind of how to pull together my first press conference. So, um, so I just wanted to, to share that and throw that out there. That's fantastic. I, I, again, show the show and tell. And, <laughs> and <focus laughs> Ver, items. Veronica, Veronica Drake inspired the show and tell. I ran to go <laughs> back, I just brought back from Texas, so. <laughs> And then Veronica, why don't we actually, so you said you had something else to share. So let me go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, um, I was uh, a member, well, I was one of the founders of Lesbian Chicago. Uh, it was a, it was our uh, attempt at having a lesbian space. Uh, and, and it was over in, um, where the heck was it? Over uh, on the North side, I forget where it was, but anyway, um, we had a lot of trans um, uh, male to female um, who were a part of that. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I also recall during the 1993, 92, 93 March on Washington, when they flew us around the country, we kind of had um, meetings where we talked about our platform. Yes, we did have an agenda. And, uh, but I also recall that trans issues as well as bisexual issues were up for a heated debate. That was not something that our community came and rushed towards. That was something that we had to come to. So I just wanted to, to and I went to a lot of Vogue balls with Joan Jeg Black. So I just want to say that. I love the Vogue balls. I think we need to know more about that too. <laughs> I miss them. Oh my God. We would, we would take over a, a building. Basically it was uh, one of those buildings in the South Loop that I'm sure are now built up. But at the time th they were all empty. So people would go in there and just take over a, a space and we'd have balls. I know it was probably all very illegal, but still. Anyway. I mean, if there are photos of those, that would be just oh. incredible. Oh, I wish it was. Well, actually, no, I don't wish there was. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Fair. It was good. It was fun. Well, you know, I think it's, it's very interesting, uh, Veronica, that you share that, you know, in, in a couple of our past exhibits, you know, we were looking back in the, like, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, and we were looking at a lot of the balls that were happening even way back in the day, you know, back in the 30s even. And a lot of those took place in that same area. Yes. You know, and you have this like beautiful exchange of drag balls and performance and competition and community coming together, especially from like the Bronzeville area through that whole South Loop area. So it looks like the tradition just continued with uh, Miss, <laughs> Miss Joan Jet Black. <laughs> oh, it was, it was off the chain. Oh, it would go everywhere. I miss Chicago. <laughs> I think we have, so we've got another question and then please you know, virtually raise your hand or chat something over to me and we still have some time for a few more questions. Um, Laura said, um, so how did you all conceive of this exhibit concept? Also great work. So yes, great work to all of you. 
Um, I mean, I can jump in for a little bit. So I was the, the project manager on this particular exhibit. Um, so we had this uh, Will, um, the director of the Gerberhard, has a list of topic ideas for uh, exhibits that run like years in advance. <laughs> so this one had come up um, and we were really excited to get to jump in and do that. So the initial like sort of seed concept came from a topic he was already developing. But you know, when we got together as a group, you know, we spent, I would say the first maybe like two months just like having these conversations, looking through the materials we had, um, reading the literature of which there is surprisingly little because this is still very recent history, right? You know, we had been so used to these uh, historical exhibits on things happening in like the 60s and everyone's written about them. And there's a million articles and things and not so with this one. So it was a process of the five of us really exchanging ideas, reaching out, talking to people, seeing what was out there, reading newspaper articles, seeing what we had in our collections and trying to find a kernel that could be a through line for this exhibit. So, you know, as, as Kurt pointed out behind us here in the exhibit space, we settled on this simple cue. Um, and I know you can't read it, uh, I'm sure you can't um, in the Zoom, but the text that's behind it is the section that Veronica read from the Queers Read This document. And so when we were looking at sort of this emergence of queer and what that meant, and specific to the 90s context and in Chicago, we really looked at that document, I think in a lot of ways as a call to action. And as we read more parts of that and fell in love with like every quote on every page, it is like an infinitely quotable. <laughs> we had this document between all of us where we're like, well, I'm gonna write this on the wall. Well, I'm gonna write that on the wall. And it was like, everybody's highlighting like everything. We could have put the whole document out there. Um, which if you're interested in reading it, I highly recommend it, it is just an empowering, sobering uh, read. Um, you can find it on QZAP in its entirety. Um, I think it's QZAP.org, Q-Z-A-P.org. Um, it's just called Queers Read This. But anyway, so we, we started sort of, I think, with that premise. And one of the things that's foundational about queerness in the 90s is that it is purposefully undefinable, right? It's, it's seeking to embrace and love this outside of categorization. Right, so when usually when we've done our exhibits, we've followed um, a timeline pretty strictly. And so chronological order seems to be how we should do our exhibit. And this time we were really trying to figure out how we should do that. And we really decided like, let's be undefinable, right? Let's come up with this cue that's not, you know, like all the, you know, all the text like cue activism at the margins of identity, like neatly written in one spot, like, let's go big, let's separate it out, let's let you come in the space and go any direction you want. And you'll find gems, you'll find pieces of the culture in any direction you move. You're not bound by a chronological timeline, otherwise you miss out on something. So we really tried to sort of stay with it indefinable um, yeah. nature. And, and I think that even <laughs> that goes to our, our building the, the bathroom stall. We're like, how do we pr present this amazing homo core stuff that we have? <laughs> like, oh yeah, we all went to punk shows like in the like 90s and early 2000s. <laughs> like, what do I remember? Everybody writing stuff in the bathroom and like you'd meet people in there and you'd see flyers for other events in there. So um, I feel like everyone just sort of like jumped in with a million ideas mm -hmm. and uh, really like took command of their areas and um, so I think that's how we, yeah. we got there. Yeah. I don't know if anyone yeah. else is something like Yeah, um, I think it's it's really cool that we got to celebrate like the fractured identity of queerness that came up in the 90s. Um, but there was also like a little bit of melancholy too, because I think we found that as people felt more empowered to be themselves, as they were more unapologetic in how they presented their gender identity, their sexual identity, I think another through thread that we found was that uh, the increased visibility of someone's queerness, regardless of where they were living at that time, uh, opened the door for them to be targeted. I know Veronica uh, Drake talked about this just briefly off the cuff uh, when she was telling her story, um, that there was a certain amount of bravery and power that needed to come with um, being that apologetic and uh, the exhibit does show that you know queers did need to bash back at some point because 
there was more violence um, against the community, more overt violence, because our community was more overt. We were no longer going to be relegated to shadows. We were no longer going to um, <laughs> find ourselves in bars that could be raided. Um, and we were pushing back, and that opened up the floodgates um, for us to be attacked. And uh, yeah, that was one unfortunate but powerful message that we also came across as we as we did the exhibit that visibility led to led to violence well along those lines i have to <laughs> thank chase and, <laughs> and veronica and everybody mm -hmm. really because i think you know when we started looking into you know queer nation and like the pink angels and like why is there all this need for in the lesbian adventures why is there all this need for community protection and so you start to get into it and you get into the statistics of violence happening in the queer community in that time why i feel like in those first couple of months i just fell into this really dark hole because i was like whoa this is so just like just soul crushing um to to, to see these numbers to read these stories um and thankfully you know, everybody around me <laughs> helped to say like, yes, and that's why we fought back. And so let's focus on that part, you know, yeah. <laughs> and like the amazing things that our communities did together. So. And it looks like we have a hand up from Rick Garcia. So Rick, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. All right, go okay. ahead. Yeah, you're there. Hey, this is, this is so wonderful. It makes my heart swell. Um, <clears throat> because I was involved in activism in those days. And I have a, a couple of things to say. First, I remember when Miguel Ayala called my office as a student at Whitney Young asking for help. And I started to say things to him and he had already done everything that I had recommended to him. And it, and it really it really made my heart swell that here was a young man who was out there fighting, risking everything. And not only that, because a lot of people do that, but he did it strategically and he did it fabulously. And I, you know, I've always admired him. Second, about trans rights, um, the first part of the story, is humiliating for me, but the second part I think is good. First part, here I am at Equality Illinois and working on a, a non-discrimination bill for LGB people. And it's time Illinois, one of the, in those days, the premier um, organization for trans rights called me and they came into my office at eight, eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. What the fuck was that about? But anyway, and they, um, they said, we want gender identity included in the state bill. And I said, uh, we can't even get sexual orientation, which people kind of understand. How are we gonna get gender identity in there? And so they talked to me and I kept, I kept pushing back. This is the humiliating thing. And at some point I realized everything that these women, and they were all women, uh, these women are asking me is what I have asked straight downstate Republican legislators for. And every argument I was giving back to them <laughs> was the same argument that I got. And I excused myself and I went into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I said, Rick, you are a little shit and let's do this. And I went out and I cried a little bit, but you'd never let, one, let anybody see you cry. I wiped my eyes and I went into that room and <clears throat> I said, I do not know how we're gonna do this. I have absolutely no clue how to do this, but you all can't do it on your own and it's all of us or none of us. And do you have language? Because <laughs> working in politics, do you have language? And they gave me language. I sent it to our chief lobbyist in Springfield. And I said, what do you think? And she said, I think we can do this. So we added gender identity. We did not tell the sponsor. And the reason we didn't tell the sponsor is that 
and who was a gay man, the only gay man down there, is because we knew he would resist. So after it being in for a year and a half, he came to me and he said, we have to take gender identity out. I said, why? Well, HRC, remember that everybody, and everybody remembers this, HRC said it would be harder to pass. And I said, name one legislator who will vote yes if that if gender identity is isn't in. Well, I don't care. I'm, I'm you know, I'm gonna take it out. I said, fine, we will find another sponsor. You can't do that. I said, watch us. So Illinois got that in there. It went through the whole process. Hardly anybody knew it was in there. And it's time Illinois always came down and testified and worked for that bill. And I was always firm about we welcome our transgender residents of the great state of Illinois in their state house. So the, the, um, the legislator passed, legislature passed it. And then we get to the city of Chicago and Lorraine Sade Baskerville came in in grand style and told her story before the committee that was hearing the bill to add gender identity to the city of Chicago human relations ordinance. And she brought tears to my eyes. She was brilliant. She talked about her arrest. She talked about shaving, taking her, her hair off and humiliating her. And she stood there so proud. And, and the ordinance passed unanimously. And I think that's largely due to Lorraine. And um, so those, those, are my, those are my reflections of that time. And the other thing is, those of us who are mainstream shirt and tie activists could never, ever, ever have done anything without ACT UP, Queer Nation. We could not, we could not, because we worked in tandem, Un unlike other cities. And let's think about this. <clears throat> in other cities, you had mainstream activists. I'm talking New York, San Francisco, DC. I lived in all you know, two of those places. And, and the mainstream activists and the street activists were always at each other's throats, demeaning each other, degrading each other. But here in Chicago, we were all the same activists. Whether you, whether you were like me in a Brooks Brothers suit and cufflinks and short colored hair, uh, or whether I was in my jeans and leather jacket laying down in the middle of Washington Street in front of a CTA bus. We were the same people and we worked in tandem. And I think that's why we have such of uh, such strong legislation here in the great state of Illinois and in the city of Chicago. That's my reflection. I see all this applause. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rick. That's fantastic stories. Thank you. Yeah, it's you very what? punk rock of you, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I said it was very punk rock of you, Rick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if, so if you have any last questions or stories please share them i'm going to ask the curators all one last question um i'm going to ask you all if you if you have a favorite part of the exhibit and then if if james and kurt if you could sh show that part of the exhibit um, but just a reminder to everyone um you can sign up for our newsletter at gerberhart.org um, the exhibit will be up in the Norman Sandfield Exhibition Gallery, so you can go check it out when we reopen. Right now we're open by appointment only, so just uh, send an email to info at gerberhart.org um, if you want to uh, go in for an appointment. So I don't know if any of you want to share your favorite part of the exhibit. Oh, James. I'll go because <laughs> I can also just pick up the uh, the laptop and show you. Um, I mean, it's like it kind of impossible to choose. There's so many good things here. Um, so I'm going to pick two, huh? 
<laughs> I know somebody, it's okay if somebody else picks it, I'll show one of them. We've already seen the homo <laughs> corner, which is like, God fills my yeah. heart with joy um, <laughs> that we made that happen. Um, but also uh, Robert Castillo generously loaned us um, some of the original banners that were carried by Queer Nation Chicago, which are inspirational, they're beautiful. Again, that was one of the most inspirational things that we had early on in this exhibit when we were deciding what we wanted to do, how we wanted to do it, and how we wanted to make this exhibit different and more immersive. Um, and so what we did is, because we didn't want to compromise, obviously, the safety and integrity of the original pieces um, by having them just up in the space where other people could touch them, we made a couple of replicas um, as a group so that you could still get the sense of what a huge banner it was and like how powerful it was. So I'm just going to show you those really quick. So this one's behind me. I know it's probably flipped backwards. So here's one of our Queer Nation Chicago's. Robert, I hope we, we did a good job approximating. <laughs> and then we have a stop the violence, stop the hate. And we really wanted those to literally physically hang over people as they come into the space. A reminder that, you know, these are the, the statements, these are the, the marches, this is the, the effort that was put in. Um, so I think that's it for me. Did you, Robert, you mentioned you had one thing to share. Do you want to, do you want to talk about that now? Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to build on what uh, Rick had said. Um, yes, we did work in tandem. Uh, I like to think that like groups like Queer Nation at times were like the folks that would come along and like, you know, jackhammer the road and then some of the other activists would come over and like smooth and and lay down you know the street um but i also want to you know give a shout out to it's time illinois yes. um they did a lot of lobbying and one one of the amazing things that they did do when i have a copy i want to send to gerber hart is um they also documented incidents of anti-transgender discrimination and so every year they would put out a report you know, on the incidents that were reported to them. And I think that was an invaluable tool in lobbying, you know, municipalities um, to include gender identity. And I think you know, that's one of the things that, you know, maybe is not talked about, but it was important that the, you know, discrimination be documented because people would say, well, you know, cases. And they would say, well, as a matter of fact, yes, we do. And that was a really important tool in order to lobby for the inclusion so i just wanted to you know make that known i, I think it's time illinois doesn't get a lot of credit for the work they did um nor does chicago gender society from where a few of it's time illinois members you know came out of so there's a lot of hidden transgendered history you know that really needs to get a spotlight and hopefully you know that'll happen in the next uh, few years or so and uh, thank you for doing this. And um, it was good to see Veronica, good to see Rick, and good to see Miguel. And you know, there's a lot more queer of color history out there. You know, unfortunately, some of it has been lost with uh, friends passing, but there's still a lot more out there to be unearthed. Thank you, Robert. Um, and then Veronica, you, you had something to share too? Yeah, I had one last thing. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Rebecca Mackey's The Great Believers. Um, it was a book that came out a few years ago. Well, in there, she tr actually starts tracing uh, the 1990s activism beginning in 1990 at one of our, uh, one of uh, ACT UP's uh, actions that we had in Chicago where we ran down the street with beds. Oh, it was, it was such a fun time. And uh, because we were protesting the fact that there was only 20 beds in the whole of Chicago uh, for uh, women, uh, women and children who had HIV or AIDS. And uh, so in there, she focused on that action, but I was online on YouTube just recently, well, actually about a couple of months ago, and I found video that was done of our action. And there's me with the back of my head screaming like an idiot. Um, and, uh, and so I invite people to go out there and look at 
1990 act up uh, a march because there it is on YouTube right now and there's a like several uh, several of uh, uh, of them of the videos but uh, you can I heard myself before I saw myself so that's that tells you something about my mouth okay thank you that's fantastic um, I'll definitely look that up I saw it. Wait, wait you had muted yourself a little earlier uh, I I wanted to say my favorite part of the exhibit. Are we still doing that? Are we still? Uh, James, can you show the photograph, um, the militant queers photograph that's under the An Army of Lovers uh, title thing that we did? It's the one uh, with uh, Joan um, and- The gun? Yeah, with the, <laughs> with the gun, yeah. Um, that photo was actually posted on Instagram by Jen, who is our social media manager. And at first we did not have any information about it. We just had it labeled as militant queers. Um, we kind of knew it was Joan, but we didn't want to assume. Um, but when Jen posted it, um, funny enough, uh, Joan, as well as everybody else in the photograph commented on the Instagram post. Uh, so we figured out who the other people in the photo were, I think actually, one of them is here tonight. I'm not sure if they want to speak, but I think Ron Stapleton um, is in the in the photograph. Um, but yeah, uh, so that was amazing and is a testament to um, that this is living history and that we're it's exciting to to dig our hands into it because just how beautiful it is to explore while these people are still alive. So that was a great little anecdote. Well, and that's is it Terry? It's a Terry Gaskins photo, I believe, right? Yeah. It's a Terry Gaskins photo, um, and yeah, I loved it, love it. In incredible photo. Um, yeah, I don't know, Chase, Veronica, or Kurt, if you have a favorite part. So my favorite image, I, I told everyone this, is the, it was featured in the presentation, but it's the recruitment uh, picture for the Lesbian Avengers with this woman holding this bomb, just saying, hey, we recruit, come hang out with us, basically. It's so cool. And I think there were several others, too, in the Lesbian Avengers section, too. They just had, like, the best the best prints and images. Um, and I, I got to say, um, the way we kind of tried to bring um, Queers Read This to life with uh, text on the walls, um, James, you can just show several of those quotes, too, if you want. Um, but the couple that I wrote were um, the one that's yeah under, if you go down, uh, that one right there. Yeah, so feel some rage. If rage doesn't empower you, try fear. If that doesn't work, try panic. Um, it just really, like, the quotes, like, all just bring it, bring it home and, like, really just put you in the moment. Like, I can't even, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but, like, when we were writing those, I just felt the words just, like, coming out of me. Um, but another one that I found that was really fun was the James, the one above the door. Um, next year we march naked and I was like, this is everything. It's fun, but it's also like next year we're going to march as, as ourselves purely and openly and without fear. And it's, it just kind of spoke to me just as the entire, the entire narrative was just like, this is, this is activism without fear and just in, out in the open. And it's just you, it's your identity uh, as a whole. So um, yeah, the whole, the whole narrative quotes and everything like that was just really, it really brought it to life for me. So I was also going to say, uh, the queer nation quotes on the wall, and I was also going to say the posters that we recreated. So instead I'm going to say, um, the photographs, the black and white photos of you and actually you were just panning over the photographs that are on loan from Joanna with the homocore movement are amazing to look at. There's like, it's like the middle of a show going on. It's just these people hanging out, having a great time being themselves. There's so much just like fearless joy in these photographs. They're really incredible. Yeah. I have a question. Is the uh, bathroom actually a bathroom? Or is it just a image of a bathroom to depict what it used to be? James is a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we, 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 it's fully 3D, as you can see, I'm gonna walk us back in here. Um, and then I did uh, some, some fake plumbing sort of elements in here. And then we have our, my, one of my favorites, the piss on the patriarchy. 
<laughs> so we have them in the bottom of the uh, trough. Um, so, I mean, I guess somebody could try to use it. <laughs> please don't. I mean, it's going to be don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't do that. <laughs> but it was really fun to like actually build this space um, that people could walk into. And we got like the bulb on a chain um, that just reminded us so much of so many of the dives and underground shows and being at the empty bottle in the 90s and like all of this like great sort of fun and like man when I think back at like my 20s heyday I'm just sort of like oh man that, that was my that was my shit you know <laughs> I miss it and I love it so it was so fun to get to build this if you ever go to New York the uh, the bathroom that's in the gay and lesbian center there was actually um, painted by Keith Haring really and, uh, the, yeah and I remember when he did that and I also remember being going there and I remember having to wait for men to come out of the bathroom because they were still using it as a bathroom for men and, uh, and before I could go in there and actually see his work. But now I think they took out the plumbing and, and it's just a, uh, an exhibit, permanent exhibit. So anyway. That's so cool. Well, I'm definitely gonna do that. The next time I can actually go to New York. <laughs> I was gonna say one one note from Joanna Brown and Joanna, thanks for coming to those photos just to note that they were David Rasteel photos. Um, and then uh, Robert, I just have to read this, said his favorite homocore shirt <laughs> read, a lifetime of listening to disco music is too high a price to pay for one's sexual orientation. So <laughs> had to share. <laughs> um, and then Kurt G, what was your favorite part of the exhibit? Um. I'm probably biased because I worked on the zines extensively. So that's probably my favorite part. But um, uh, I was really taken with with uh, Vaginal Davis. She was someone that I had uh, learned about in grad school, and I was just captivated by her as this punk rock queer like trailblazer. And it was really exciting to like find all of the zines that we have of hers in, in our collection. So she, she has um, one over here, which is uh, shrimp. I mentioned that she had a, has a thing for her feet. So this was all about, you know, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, uh, putting feet on a pedestal, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but she also uh, did uh, these ones uh, called Fertile Latoya Jackson, which was like just all, all about art and, you know, queer culture and photography and, you know, just all of this like, you know, all these really cool and interviews with all of the, the prominent members of like the, you know, the homocore movement. And so, it was really cool to to sort of reconnect with with her as you know as this this you know crazy cool you know artist and musician and so that was my 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 favorite my favorite thing. <laughs> as a side note, since we're talking about the zines, I think this is my favorite down here. I don't know if you can see it. This is in your face and up your ass. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, on that note, I was just gonna say thank you all for coming and thank you to our curators for all of the work on this exhibit and James and Kurt, thank you for going in and showing us the exhibit virtually too. And, <laughs> and thank you also to all the, the activists from the 90s for all the work you did and for sharing your stories as well tonight. Um, we'll post this video on our website in a couple of weeks. So please go to gerberhart.org to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and if you're not following us on Facebook and Instagram at gerberhart, please give us a follow. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks job. everybody. Thanks everybody. So glad I came. <laughs>